Bible says this, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. If you remember from last week, I'm, I'm interrupting the reading here. Uh, Jesus decided to cross over to the other side of the uh, Sea of Galilee, and they were in a ship, and there were other little ships, the Bible says. And while they were making that journey across this uh, the sea there, uh, there was a raging storm that just all of a sudden took place, and, and uh, Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat. And the disciples were fearing for their lives, and they went, and they woke up Jesus. And so um, Jesus calmed the storm, we know, and we understand that Jesus is the master of the sea. He's the master of all the storms in our lives, and uh, we ought to cling and be close to him. He never gets rattled with the storms in life, although we may. And uh, so he passes over the other side of the sea now is uh, where we pick up reading here. And this is the whole reason, I believe, that he went over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee just for one man. One man that was hopeless, one man that was in despair, one man that had lived with destruction in his life and, and uh, just a terrible situation. The Bible says he was possessed not by one devil, but by several Devils, several demons. There's about two thousand, and the name was the name of these. Uh, they called themselves Legion. These demons did because there were so many devils that were in this man, and uh, this man hoped that uh, uh, Jesus was the answer to his situation. We learned that he was. By the way, Jesus is the answer for any situation that you're facing. That there's hopelessness sin, bondage, what have you. Uh, he's applicable for you today, just as he was these some um, 2,000 years ago here. Verse number two, And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him a man out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been oft bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. So he's got a, a maniac, a wild man. They couldn't bind him with chains. He was breaking those chains off, those shackles. He'd break them off. Nobody could, could corral this guy. He was so powerful with this demonic influence. And always, verse number five, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And that was a great voice right there. And he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? So get, get a visual in your mind. This demon-possessed man saw Jesus ran over to him, and bowed down. He worshipped him. He got, I don't believe it was like, I don't believe he was playing a guitar worshipping. I believe he fell flat on his face and, and worshipped God, bowed in prostrate form, and worshipped Jesus. But then he said this, kind of kind of ironic. Why would he run over there and worship him? And then he says, what have I to do with thee? A kind of an oxymoron, double, whatever, you know, I don't know. Just just a little, why would you worship him if you're like, what have I to do with thee? Of course, it was the demons speaking here. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and crowd, cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, by the way, Jesus was never going to torment you. Jesus will never torment anybody. Um, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not, for he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? Jesus asked this man, what is, the, what is the name of the demon that's in him? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. So Legion said, Would you not send us out of the country? Now there was there nigh into the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. Forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out, 
and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They that were about 2,000 and were choked into the sea. They that fled, uh, fed the swine, uh, they fled and told into the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with a devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. The power of God. They that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. They began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when, there, uh, when he was coming to the ship, he that had possessed uh, with the devil prayed him that he might be with them. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all the men did marvel. Let's pray. God, I need you. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to hearts. I know your word does not return void. I ask that you would accomplish that which we desire in our hearts this morning. I pray that you'd fill me with thy holy. I pray that you'd messages, message this would you bless our time as we gather? You alone are worthy to be praised. Worship you this morning. And you may be seated. <clears throat> Thank you for standing. I know that was a long time. So I wasn't trying to uh, tap you out by uh, making you stand longer. If you needed to sit down, of course, that would. Um, but uh, we see in our text here this morning, it follows the great miracle that Jesus performed as he came uh, across the uh, the Sea of Galilee, and he calmed uh, the raging sea that had arisen while they were sailing over uh, the Sea of Galilee. And as we come to chapter 5, we're going to encounter several more miracles that Jesus performed as he walked among uh, the earth for his brief amount of time, 33 and a half years or so. And uh, we're going to find him uh, here in this passage, though, Casting out demons. Uh, later on, he healed uh, dreadful diseases and even raised a young girl uh, from the dead. And by the way, he's in the uh, dead raising uh, business today as well. And uh, he's in the business of raising uh, dead spirits uh, from the grave. We, the Bible says we are born uh, spiritually dead. And uh, the Bible says we, again, everybody in this world, in order to go to heaven, needs to be born again. And we do that by understanding that uh, Jesus uh, died on the cross to pay for our sin. Everybody in this world is, uh, has inherited a sin nature. I didn't have to teach any of my boys how to sin. They already knew how to do that. They have a sinful mama. And uh, that's partially, uh, I mean, it, it's 100% true. She is a, I'm more of a sinner than she is. But uh, the fact of the matter is, um, our kids became sinners because two sinners passed on the sin to them. And then, prior to us being married, our sinful parents passed that sin on to us. And so the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of God. Everybody is born with a sin nature. That's the problem that we all have. That's the problem that separates us from a holy and just God. And because of our sin, none of us deserve to go to heaven. The Bible says heaven is a perfect place. There's no sin, no suffering, no sorrow. It's perfect. And so if God was to let sin into heaven, it would no longer be a perfect place. And so God in his love and uh, care for us, he made uh, the plan of salvation. Uh, the Bible says that the foundation of the world and that plan of salvation uh, for us as humans to be redeemed. In his love, he sent his son Jesus to be the payment for our sin. See, Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood so that we don't have to. And if we will, by faith, acknowledge that, uh, Lord, I'm a sinner and I can't do anything to earn my way to heaven. There isn't a church that I can belong to. There isn't an amount of money that I can pay. Praise the Lord for that. I'd be, I'd be out. 
Um, there isn't enough good things that I can do to earn my way to heaven. Jesus is the one that did good things for me by sacrificially giving himself on the cross, shedding his blood. A time when I acknowledge my sin condition, Jesus died to pay for my sin. I need to personally receive his blood, my account. That's a covering, the Bible says. It's a, it's a, his blood will wash away all my sin. We just sang this morning, uh, my Jesus, I love thee. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I love him because he first loved me, the Bible says. He loved me so much. He loved me this much. He gave himself the cross. But here's the thing. He didn't stay dead. Uh, in the, the, the grave, he rose from the grave three days later. And because of that, that's the opportunity, that's the reason that we can also have a resurrection when our earthly bodies die someday. And so his payment needs to be received from our account. That's when a person gets born again. I wonder, is there a time you were born again? Everybody is born one time physically but not everybody is born a second time spiritually. Jesus said, marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. And so I wonder, have you been born again? We see the born again day for this maniac as we get into this passage here uh, this morning. He got born again. He got, uh, I believe he got, uh, he got transformed. And so, as we come to chapter 5, we see many uh, awesome things that Jesus did. And I believe this chapter, though, it emphasizes the great power and the compassion that Jesus had as he ministered in various places around this area of Capernaum. He even, even obliged, just pointing this out here, I find it just kind of uh, weird myself, but he obliged uh, to the demon's request as uh, they not be cast out of the country. And uh, there was no need, though. There was no need too great or too small. And everywhere that Jesus went, he transformed lives. And by the way, he transformed lives today as well. And so for the believer, each of the accounts in Mark chapter 5, they paint a beautiful picture of the transformation that has taken place in us as believers. We've been set free from the bonds of sin. We've been healed of the dreaded infirmity of our iniquity. And we've been delivered uh, from eternal death and condemnation. And uh, now we are told to broadcast this message of salvation to all the world, just like this maniac was later on in the story. And so as we get into this chapter here this morning for, for a while, I want, you to, I want to examine with you uh, the details uh, that are described in this text. And I want you to consider, as I've entitled this message here, uh, from maniac to missionary. From maniac to missionary. Look at number one here. We consider the maniac. We consider the maniac. Our text here, it reveals a man who is in need of Jesus. I want you to notice with me this maniac, where he dwelt. Notice his dwelling. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. And so we find that this man, this maniac, if you will, that's what the Bible calls him, he lived among the tombs. And this wasn't just a place that he spent some time. How many have ever been to a cemetery before? Maybe you've paid respect to somebody that I uh, have, and I've been to a few different cemeteries. And, um, I appreciate them. I I personally like that. I want to have my remains at a cemetery someplace someday to where my loved ones consider me, get away, and typically they're in peace. Oh, and and uh, beautiful, they can be beautiful and, and such, but the Bible says this maniac, he wasn't just visiting tombs. He wasn't just visiting the, the cemetery of his loved ones, what have you. The Bible says he lived in where the tomb were. He made his residence there. Probably shouldn't have, right? You don't, you don't want to raise your hand because you admit you did it. But, but um, 
I'll be truthful, okay, uh, I have, and, and it can be eerie, especially when you're not saved, right? Um, you know that when you're saved, greater is he that, he that is in you than he that is in the world, and, uh, but the fact of the matter is those were dead, those people were alive, now they're dead, and they did have spirit, uh, was it born again or not? And so the spiritual realm is not an invisible place. It is a real, I mean, it is invisible, but it is a real, it's not a, uh, it's not a fictitious place. It is a real place. We're in a spiritual realm right now. Your physical bodies are here, but if you are saved, your spirit is bearing witness of this spiritual book. If you're not saved, this, your spirit is uh, fighting against this spiritual book. But anyhow, we see that this maniac, he lived in the tombs. It wasn't just a place where he spent time. It was his dwelling. He, he spent and he lived his days among the dead. This maniac here, his life, it pictures those that are separated from God in sin. They are spiritually dead and they have no fellowship with those who are alive in Christ. They're literally dwelling among the dead in a spiritual sense. And Praise God, though, if you've been saved, you no longer live among the dead. You live among the living, the spiritually born again. You're now a spiritual creature. You've been born into the uh, family of God. And, and so we see here, we see this man, this maniac's dwelling place. Number next, we see his desperation. Look at verse number four. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broke in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs and crying and cutting himself with stones. Here this man was cutting himself. By the way, if you've ever done any cutting, you know somebody that does cutting? Common sense, okay? Common sense says that's not a good thing. The Bible says that's not a good thing as well. That is a spiritually good thing. God wants to help you back. Sometimes people cut themselves in a in a cry or in a plea, calling out for help. I'll help you. I'll point you to Jesus, the one that can help you with it. Well, we'll help you through it. I'll be there. I'm not just gonna I'll help you in the situation. So we see this man, he was desperate. He cried always night and day. And in the tombs, he was crying and he was cutting himself. And he lived a life that was out of control. And others had tried to help him, but, but they couldn't. And his life was dominated by the influences of Satan. And he'd been bound with chains, but, but he couldn't be tamed. And he lived a life of despair. And he was sad and lonely. And he'd been rejected by society. And totally avoided uh, by uh, people for the most part. And the torments of life for this man uh, in desperation, they never ceased. Seemingly hope this maniac. The Bible says in verse number five, day and night, the pain and the torments and the misery of life was upon him. He found no comfort and he had no peace and it was only despair and it was only desolation. Many around us today are in the same desperate situation. I don't know anybody who dwells in a cemetery necessarily at all. But, uh, man, life can be difficult. And people go through things. And, and sometimes it's because of poor decisions. It's bad decisions. But, but other times, as we learn, as uh, Jesus took the disciples through the storm, uh, sometimes it, they, bad things just happen. But God wants to help you through those things. And God's got the answer, and Jesus is the answer, and he wants to help you out of the desperation and the defeat and, and uh, the, uh, the, the destruction. Many people are living in despair. They're, they're, in the, they're in the seemingly hole of no hope. Maybe you're not there today, but how many would be honest? And say, Anna, there's been times, Pastor Sam, I felt hopeless. To be honest. Even being saved, there have been times where I thought, man, hope is pretty, uh, pre pretty, pretty not very close right now. And I felt like, man, everything's just crashing down. And, 
And uh, and uh, but praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I I had the hope of heaven, but I didn't just have the hope of heaven. I had a Savior that cared for my situation as well. And so this man was out of control, and he was hopeless. And and uh, there are people around us that are in despair, and they are dead spiritually, and their lives are dominated by sin. Even people that have been saved, uh, we have a problem sometimes of building up sin and and uh, not getting right with God and and uh, people involved in drugs and alcohol and sexual addictions and every day uh, begins the same way uh, for them in despair and they find no way of escape and they continue to live in defeat and this man right here was in this situation this man lived a tragic life like many do today no hope, no joy, no peace or comfort, seemingly. Constantly searching for a way to escape the pain and the suffering. But I want to say this, thank God for Jesus. Thank God for a living Savior. Thank God for somebody that cares even more than your parents or your family does. God cares. Jesus cares about you. Jesus cares for you. I don't care what's your situation. Jesus loves you. Jesus cares for you. He wants to help you. He wants to help you and lift you out of that hole of no hope. When the Savior reached down for me, he had to reach way down for me. I was lost and undone without God or his son, but he reached way down and he saved my soul and he's given me victory and the promise of a home in heaven someday. More than I could ever ask for. I wish I could meet this maniac. If I could have met this maniac, I'd have been like, maniac, you've got to meet my Savior. But he already knew. He already knew the answer. And the Bible says he ran, and he, and he, and he saw Jesus, and he bowed, and he worshipped him. The miracle here. I'm just talking about the maniac. I'm just giving you the bad stuff so far. We're about to talk about the master here. see this man this maniac we see his dwelling place we see his desperation he wanted help he had no hope though and then we see his desire his desire in verse number two he's come out of the ship immediately there met a man out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit look at verse number six when he saw jesus afar off he ran and he worshiped him this maniac this demon possessed man uh uh that was a dealing with circumstances beyond his control, beyond that he could do anything about. And let me say this, don't, don't, if you're in despair, hey, hey, it's, it, you're not the first one that has ever felt like there's no hope. You're not the first one that has ever been in, in despair thinking that, man, nobody can help me with this situation. Nobody can help me with the problem. I felt like that before. My wife felt like that before. A multitude of people in here have felt like that before. But there is hope and there is help. And he had a desire. This demon-possessed man had a desire for hope, just a glimpse of hope and help. And it was here. He was dealing with the circumstance beyond his control. And did you know that we cannot handle sin ourselves? We can't. The, the, the hopelessness that we have sometimes comes from sin. And there's nothing that we can do about that. We need a Savior. We need the one that has conquered the sin. We need the one that gives victory. And uh, the very same thing right here. We can't handle sin ourselves. We need Jesus. This man must have longed for the day when that suffering would end. And, and there was a day when he caught a glimpse of that hope when he saw Jesus, can you imagine the scene here? He's lived a life of torment among the tombs, and one day a small boat arrives from the other side, and there's a there's kind of a posse, I guess. You know, the disciples and other little boats. Uh, Jesus comes off, and he gets off the ship there onto the shore, and something within this maniac knew that Jesus was his only hope. And I want to say that Jesus is the only hope. 
I don't know if the man knew Jesus necessarily, but the demons inside of him clearly knew uh, who Jesus was. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 19, the devils also believe and they tremble. By the way, uh, devils, demons, they know who Jesus is. They know that they are a defeated foe. I don't, I don't comprehend it. I don't know why in the world uh, stupid demons would want to reject and rebel against God and become fallen, uh, or angels become fallen and uh, devils, uh, but that's how it happened. And uh, they know who the Savior is, and they tremble, the Bible says. Whatever the case, it's found at the feet of Jesus, and he's worshiping him. Folks, this world is filled with those who are in pain, and we may never see or, or know them, but the pain is very real, and they long for a means to escape their desperation, and Jesus is the way. We see number one here. We see the maniac. This Most importantly, master. Consider the master. This text here reveals much about our Savior. Much about Jesus. We see, number one, we see his presence. Look at verse number one. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, unto the country of the Gadarenes. And notice here that Jesus came to where the demoniac was. Jesus knew his condition and where to find him. It wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't luck. Jesus didn't just decide to, uh, to, to take a stroll in a boat and go across the ocean there. Jesus had purpose for why he went across that ocean. He wanted to save a soul. He cared about that demon. He cared about that demon-possessed man. And he wanted to save him. He wanted to transform him. He wanted to help him. There wasn't anything about his race that he wanted or cared about. There wasn't anything about his uh, nationality or his background that merited him any favor. He just cared for him, and he just loved him, and he wanted to help him. And so he went across the sea, this master, our Savior. By a divine appointment, purpose, that he crossed over the sea to get there. You realize that when a person fills, this will often dust. Not just salvation. Maybe a physical need that we can fill in the Holy Spirit. God is speaking to all Christians. Help them with it. It may be that the Spirit of God has been telling you. Can't share the bearing witness to I got loved one wants you to share the gospel with. So we see here uh, the master. Consider the master. We see his presence. It's interesting to note that Jesus did nothing else while he was in Gadara. We don't find him teaching in a synagogue. We don't find him feeding multitudes. We don't find him uh, doing anything else. He went across the Sea of Galilee and he came through the storm on the other side to reach this one lost sinner. That one lost, wretched soul needed a Savior and Jesus showed up in the hour of need. Those of that have been saved here this morning, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that he way down for you and saved you? I, I, uh, I remember getting saved. Some of you know my salvation testimony. It was on a Thursday night. I went to an honest program, kind of similar to Patch Club like we have here on Wednesday, where the youth could come and play games and, and learn Bible songs and, and uh, learn the Bible and, and grow in the Lord. It's discipleship. And the Lord, the Lord knew I needed to be saved, and I was invited. The Lord used uh, physical people, friends, invited me. I was nine years old years old, went and I was lured there by cookies that, that uh, punch, okay, 
and uh, went and had cookies, and I knew they played games and stuff, and I got preached to that evening, and, and um, I heard a Bible message. I don't remember what it was, but there was an invitation for salvation, and I went forward. I raised my hand that I needed to be saved, and I went off to the side of the room, and there was an older man uh, that show, opened his Bible and showed me how I could be saved, and I got saved off, the, off the, to the side of the room there, and I don't know if anybody else got saved that evening. I don't think there was. Might have been the only one that I that got saved out of the. There's probably I don't know. There was probably 50 young people in there, young brats, and they're probably fooling around with their costumes and things like that. Uh, but or their uniforms. They had Awanas. We had these badges. And, but I remember I got saved. He found me. Newberry Springs, California, Newberry Community Church on the side of the room there, and I got saved. He came, and he found me, and I got saved. He'll do the same for you if you need to be saved too. Jesus loves you. He knows your needs, and he wants to meet those needs today, and he died for you. You're, you're the reason why he died on the cross. He gave his life. He wants to save you. We see the master's presence. We see his preeminence. Look at verse number seven. And he cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee? Jesus, thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Jesus appeared that day and uh, the man immediately knew that this was the son of God. This was the holy one, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And he was aware that Jesus was there and uh, that he possessed all deity, that he had all power to help him and to forgive him of his sin and to cast out those demons. And even the demons acknowledged his deity. That's what's required. If a person is going to be saved and set free from the bondage of sin, if you've never done so, uh, they, you need to recognize that uh, Jesus for who he is and your need for him, and you must be willing to do so. He's the only way to be redeemed and, and uh, given eternal life. And we must come to the place that we realize that we need Jesus. If you don't acknowledge that you've got a problem, how are you going to be saved from that problem? We must see ourselves as unworthy and undone before him, and we need to personally receive him. We see the master's power. We see the master's preeminence. And... Uh, uh, well, we see the master's power. Look at verse number eight. And he said unto him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And I, by the way, I believe Jesus asked that question, not because he didn't know, but for us to know uh, the name of the demon. Jesus knows everything. God knows everything. Sometimes Jesus asks questions, that we'll see the answers. And so, um, and forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place under the sea. There was about 2,000 of these and, and choked in the sea. And for those who knew this man, this man was in a hopeless situation. He had dwelt among the tombs, and he ran about naked, and he was unable to be bound, and he was cutting himself with stones and he was filled with a multitude of demons and he was in desperation in desperate condition and there was only one who could help this man and he had come and it was jesus and jesus immediately commanded come out of the man and isn't it amazing that at the voice of jesus satan has to flee the word of God, the spoken word was how he created the world. The spoken word was how he created everything, a creation. And he said, come out of the man. You're here this morning and maybe you've lived a life that's been controlled by sin. Or maybe you are in this helpless and hopeless mindset maybe more than just a mindset jesus can bring victory so got the power to cleanse your heart got the power to forgive sin and to redeem your soul if jesus possessed the power to save this man and he did 
got the power to save you. Think about this. Think about how awful. 2,000 demons within a person. I've had, I have stories where I heard of people being and a couple of uh, a couple of personal one that I heard kind of third party was there was a youth uh, youth department had taken a trip to a camp camp church camp and uh, during the services young men just and just started up like a grown man's voice like this voice came out of him, and uh, I don't know all of the details about what he, really the, and they talk about how it took multitude of the youth workers, I'm trying to scare you anybody, I'm telling you the actual testifying story that I heard, and uh, I believe it had to be 100%, I got more stories that I can tell. But these uh, grown men, youth workers, took took all several of them to to try to control this young major exactly or not, but to control him to to, uh, to subdue. And uh, <clears throat> they ended up praying over the over the young man. Uh, I think they tried to pray, and uh, the the demon gave a name, I forget. For however many there were, I don't know exactly. Gave the name and prayed over him, and I think he ended up getting saved. And the came back and they testified of this. Me, that's, that's a crazy story. I'm just saying that God did this. God can. God can. At the voice of Jesus, Satan led. Jesus has forever defeated sin on the cross. Jesus has the power to release. From the bondage of sin, whatever whatever stronghold you may have, whatever stronghold you may have, have, many here can testify of God giving victory over addictions, over certain substances. God is the one that can do that. Jesus is the one that can do that. Jesus possessed the power to save this man, and he can he can save anybody. There's not anybody that's too far gone. And, and by, the, by the way, if there is, God is the one that decides that. God knows that. Right? God, God is the one that knows that. We're the ones that are to give the message. He forever defeated sin on the cross, and Jesus has the power to release from bondage and sin. And if we'll trust him, the, the power of Jesus, uh, God transforms this hopeless man. We see the maniac. We see the master. Lastly, we're done. See, we see the miracle that the master made in the maniac. I'm going to say that. <laughs> master did a miracle with the maniac. Jesus made a difference in this man's life. This is the same man that for a few moments before was a maniac and he was living among the tombs. He was running around naked, cutting himself, and he was super strong, and nobody could bind him, and they couldn't put chains. He kept breaking the chains, and in a moment's time, he went from a complete despair uh, to eternal deliverance. See his conversion. Look at verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. As these people gathered around to see the spectacle of this maniac that was now, he wasn't naked anymore, and he was clothed, and he was in his right mind, and 
he wasn't acting like a fool and he wasn't cutting himself and he wasn't yelling around and and uh, they encountered something they never imagined. This was the same man who had brought terror to the people, to that region. He was the crazy man, the crazy village man, and uh, but now he'd been changed. And the Lord had made all the difference in his life. I want you to see what the Lord did for this man. Number one, notice his comfort. This man is now this former maniac, former demon-possessed man. He's now found sitting next to Jesus. He's no longer running among the tombs. He's no longer desperate for peace in his heart. He's no longer tormented by the demonic influence and the effects of sin. And uh, if you're living a life on the run and among the dead, Jesus alone can provide the comfort that you need. And you need to come to him and sin. You can sit at his feet in fellowship with him. And he'll give you comfort from here on out. We see his comfort that he got. We see next we see his clothing. This naked, once naked man, and he's now he's clothed. He's sitting and clothed. He's no longer running around in the tombs, naked and unclothed. He's dressed and presentable. And there's a profound truth in here that although there was an inward change, it was also reflected outwardly as well. We see his comfort. We see his clothing. And the Lord had worked on the inside. And it was visible on the outside. I had a story of nakedness, demonic, bit like that. But um, we had done a Bible study. I think I told the story before. We were on the Big Island of Hawaii, and and the Boltons had come back from the island of Oahu. Our missionaries, and he reached out to me, said, uh, our, to us, and said, "Man, did you ever feel like it was virtually?" I didn't say it. Pre- on a very oppressive demigods and, and a multitude of different things. And they, they once offered kids to a volcano sacri- a sacrifice to their gods. <laughs> and, uh, but any, anyhow, we, we were on the big island. This was not the island the... Uh, um, Boltons went. Maybe they have been there. I don't know. We were starting a church there, and uh, we met a small pocket of uh, of El Salvadoran people who were coffee farmers on the southernmost tip of the Big Island, and they were Christian. We met them through a mutual missionary friend, and he asked if we would come lead a Bible study down there. It drove about an hour and a half away from where we lived, and in the evening, and we had a Bible study, good time of fellowship, and man, good food, and good coffee, and they have a Starbucks coffee, by the way, Ka'u coffee is one of the research, or at least it was, a certain amount of time, but on our way back, now the Big Island is, is different than Oahu, and we, we noticed that they're, uh, but the area that we were in, I mean, they talk about Night marchers and night marchers, stories of warriors that have been killed in battle, and uh, they believe some believe that night marchers were just just a big army of the Hawaiian warriors marching at night. And I don't know the leaders' name. If uh, they could be just march through your village, and if you make eye contact with them, and so if the night marchers are coming through your village, you don't make eye contact. You just freeze and don't make eye contact. You let them march past you. They've never seen it. But, I mean, that's just one of them. I mean, nakedness can be rampant on islands, right? We were coming back from that Bible study, and it was raining. It rained just about every single day in, in where we lived. And we got just about home, and I was literally, man, I was... I thought I was seeing vision. I was so tired. It was probably like night or so. And coming back home, it was raining. My wife was here. We probably had Sammy and Rocky in the back. Maybe even some other. It was just a, us four. And raining. We're about almost home. and But I'm going super fast. And windshield wipers. And then uh, all of a sudden, I'm like, 
naked person in the middle of the road, in the rain. I swerve off. I'm off. I think my wife was, I didn't swerve off the road. I just swerved out of the way. And I wasn't going to stop for this guy, right? And my wife is like, like, that I saw. And I said, call the police. And uh, I'm exactly how I'm getting off the story here, other than the nakedness and the demon possession. No, no doubt this man might have had demonic influence at the very least if he wasn't possessed. But um, I told my wife to call the call the police and report it. So she called the police, 911. Uh, yeah, we. Uh, my wife said, there's a naked man on this highway doing jumping jacks. And the, uh, what do you call them? The stature uh, said, them. I think she said something like, he's the only naked man on the road there. And uh, I said, no, you're not going to describe him. No, I didn't say that. But we went home and we chalked it up to, man, demonic influence, warfare, and an experience, a story I could tell someday when I'm preaching. But uh, we see his comfort. We see this man's cl- demon possessed man. We see once demon possessed man. We see his comprehension he was sitting and he's clothed and in his right mind and meeting jesus had affected the way this man thought he was no longer controlled by satan he was no longer desired the things of the world or the the pleasures of uh the 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 bad stuff of sin and his mind was focused on the lord he was in his right mind the bible says this encounter with jesus encounter jesus there begins a renewing of the mind. You're now born spiritually, yes, but our mind needs to transform as well. And Jesus is the one that helps do that. And discipleship helps do that as we grow and learn about him. You'll no longer question or deny the power of the Lord, and your thoughts will no longer be controlled by the things of the world or the lusts of the flesh, but we can now focus on the Lord and the things that matter. We see his conversion, and then we see his commission. We're done right here. Look at verse number 18. When he was come nigh into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. After he got saved, uh, this man had a desire to be with him. After he got transformed, this maniac now wanted to be with the man that helped him, God that helped him. I wonder this morning, since you've been saved, do you have that desire to walk with him? I think we ought to evaluate. I, I think it ought to naturally be there spiritually, yes, but, but we also need that spirit and grow and, and fan this walk with our Savior. This man went, he came to Jesus and Jesus, can I go along with you? Can I go on the boat with you and go where you're going next? Basically, said, uh, verse number 19, Howbeit Jesus suffered him not. He said unto him, Go home to thy friends. My response, if, the, if I was the demoniac, former demoniac, I'd be like, I don't have any friends. <laughs> right? But he said, Go home to thy friends and uh, tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee and so he obeyed maybe reluctantly i don't know but he obeyed and he departed and he began to publish in decapolis how great things jesus had done for him and all the men did marvel he wanted to be with the one that brought him the deliverance and he had a desire to want to walk with him and fellowship with him but jesus had another plan for him as well and he was to go and he was to tell what had happened in his life and folks if you've been saved if god has transformed you He wants you to do the same thing as well. He wants you to tell him, people, how great things he hath done for you. And he saved your soul. When the Savior reached down for me, he had to reach way down for me. I was lost and undone without God or his son. He went and the man wasted no time. He began to publish what the Lord had done for him. And he had told it around Decapolis. He told it around 
the region of 10 cities that included Gadara, and he became a true disciple of the maniac to missionary. But we didn't deal with this here, but those in Gadara, they rejected Jesus, and Jesus messed up a lot of things with their situation. I believe they were complaining about Jesus casting the demons into the pigs. Some of them had their financial uh, situations messed up. Man, he, uh, he made all our pigs drown. Uh, I can understand being upset about bacon, right? But I don't think that that's uh, what they were upset about. And uh, this world uh, doesn't want you to get uh, to Jesus, even though he's ready to deliver, save. I asked this morning, are you as the maniac among anybody? I would totally like that, but maybe you've got some things that he's struggling with. Maybe you are not saved. Maybe you have been saved and by his grace, but then and there's been some burdens of life that have robbed you of your joy. If so, I want to acknowledge your need. Tell him you need him, whatever your situation is, whatever your circumstance. Eighty, willing, and already made the trip across the Sea of Galilee, verbally speaking. There for you, waiting for you to call unto him. Father, I thank you that you're a miracle worker. I thank you, thank you that you are a hell raiser. You desire to raise the dead from eternal hell, lake of fire. You desire to save souls. You desire to give victory. It's not just that you desire for people only to go to heaven, but you desire for them to have victory while they're on this earth as well. You're the way by which that can happen. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, a few questions by what we call uh, our invitation time. Maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart in some capacity this morning. It's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God can speak to us. Speaks, sometimes we mistake him for our conscience, but God has a way of speaking to us in a still, small voice through his word. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, is there somebody here? How many here would say, Pastor Sam, I have been saved. I used to be a maniac. Maybe that's your testimony. You used to be a maniac, even proverbially, proverbially speaking. You used to be a maniac, but you have been saved. You have been saved. There's a time when you got born again. Would you slip your hand up? Would you testify that you got saved? Slip your hand up if that's you. Slip your hand up right now. Amen. Many hands were up. Many. Every hand was up. For honesty. Maybe there's somebody here that say, Pastor Sam, I wasn't able to raise my hand because I don't know that I've been saved, but I'd like to get that settled. I'd like to have victory that Jesus can give, and I'd like to have victory over my sin and be born again into God's family. I'd like to be saved. Is there somebody here this morning? That's your prayer. That's your prayer. Would you slip your hand up? You'd like to be saved. Anybody at all, would you slip your hand up? You'd like to be saved. You'd like to be saved from your sin. Have the hope of eternal life in heaven. How many here would say, Pastor Sam, God spoke to my heart about the, his power, and, and he's got power over, over death and hell and demons and, and a wickedness and Satan. God spoke to my heart about victory, and I desire victory in my life. Would you slip your hand up if that's you? Desire victory that only God can give. Slip your hand up. My hand's up. Let's all stand this morning.